Oh yeah, Tsang Male, Sandra Tahideles. Okay, so good evening and welcome everyone. It's very nice to see you. We will begin by giving answers to the questions. We have five questions from English that came in English and two in Chinese. So we'll start straight away with the questions. Okay, so the first question, it was about this uh, meditation that we do, uh, where we have the guru as, that includes uh, three beings. All right, so this is a type of meditation that we do either when we visualize the refuge objects and we have the guru as having those three beings, or when we do the visualization of the field of accumulation, the merit field. In both of those cases, we do this particular meditation where we have the guru and also we have the aspect of Buddha Shakyamuni and they represent the commitment or Samaya being. And then at uh, the heart of Buddha Shakyamuni, we have Vajradhara that represents the wisdom being. And then at the heart of the wisdom being, we have this level Hum that represents the concentration being. Okay, so the question is, what is the significance of those things? Is this uh, a practice that we find in Sutra as well as in Tantra? What are the main points of this meditation? Why do we do this and so forth? Okay, so first of all, to clarify, this particular type of visualization where we visualize the three, it's called sometimes translated as the three nested beings, one inside the other, is exclusively a tantric practice. You don't even hear the term, let alone do this practice within the context of sutra. So it's exclusively a sutric practice. And as we have said, the easy path uh, has a connection with with tantric practice and therefore it is mentioned here in this visualization. Again, having said that this is a tantric practice, we need to understand that it is a practice that we do find present in the three lower tantras. However, it is most predominant in the practice of highest yoga tantra. So most usually you will find this practice in highest yoga tantra. Okay, so now why is it that we meditate in this way? The reason that we meditate in this way is because we have a basis that needs to be purified through our practice. And the basis to be purified is our body, our speech, and our mind. Body, speech, and mind are examined or exist in three levels. The gross level, the subtle level, and the most subtle level. So... When we meditate on the commitment or the Samaya being, it is there for the purpose of purifying the body in the gross level. We meditate on the wisdom being in order to purify the speech or the subtle wind. And we meditate on the concentration being in order to purify ex extremely subtle wind. So what happens is that we begin meditating on this already when we are at the stage of the beginning, the basic stage, so that as we progress along the path, um, we have this aspect of the resultant state. In, and by doing this practice, we mature the root of virtue so that when we reach the resultant state, we will have accrued all the capacity to do that and we will have all the imprints to achieve that. So that's the purpose. The second question was about this statement that in order to generate realizations in our mind stream, we must build up our accumulation of merit and we must purify negativity. So there was a question about what is this accumulation of merit? How do you accumulate merit? And whether that is done specifically on the path of accumulation. Okay, so when we use here the term merit, we refer to virtue. So when we say you need to accumulate merit, it means you need to practice uh, um, virtue. So there is not a specific time that we allocate for the practice of virtue. It's like we should be practicing virtue all the time, ideally, any activity that we do. So as you're speaking, as you're eating, as you're sleeping, as you walk, 
walking, you should ideally be accumulating merit. If we are capable of doing it 24 hours a day, along with every one of our activities, obviously that would be ideal. Okay, so how do our activities become meritorious or virtuous activities? We have to be motivated we must have a special motivation so we must have this intention to say that all my activities of my body my speech and my mind i want them to be of benefit to myself and others so when you carry out activities with this motivation this becomes virtue it becomes merit okay this the the other part of the question that is talking about the path of accumulation right specifically the path of accumulation so we have two things that we need to accumulate. We need to accumulate merit and we need to accumulate wisdom. So when we say that we accumulate merit, technically this is um, the activity that we do must be influenced by bodhicitta. It must be influenced by compassion. And, you know, definitely there is a particular time on the path of accumulation where those things are uh, established. Um, however, you know, we say that with the proper motivation, every activity that we do from right now contributes towards this accumulation of merit. So, for example, we make prostrations, we make offerings, we confess our negativity. All those things count as the accumulation. So specifically, you think this motivation I am doing this in order to bring benefit, not just in this life, but in the future lives. I want to, in the future lives, I want to be free from the suffering of the lower migrations. And more specifically, I want to work towards reaching enlightenment in order to benefit all other sentient beings. So with this motivation, when we engage in activities that become merit, the accumulation of our merit. Okay, um, the third question is where to place the text and the stupa? Is there a particular order, especially in relation to, let's say, the main uh, representation of the body of the Buddha that would be a statue? So Geshe says, I have not seen any specific clear reference of that in any text. But taking as an example, right, um, the image of Venerable Manjushri. If you look at the hand implements of Manjushri, in his right hand, he's holding, holding the sword, and in his left hand, he's holding the text. So, Geshe was saying, this is my idea, this is my suggestion, taking from that statue of Manjushri, I think that if you put the text that is, that is representing the speech, on the left of the body, that would be fine. And then if you put the stupa representing the mind to the right side, that would be fine. Okay, if you feel uncomfortable with that, just swap their places, okay? But this is what um, Geshe-la is suggesting. Just look at the image of Manjushri. Where does he put the text? Where does he put the sword? And do it accordingly. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, then um, we have another question that talks, is asking about how do you actually arrange um, the deities? So, so let's say you have statues of the deities. How do you arrange those in your altar? So let's say, uh, would you put a Tara to the right of the main figure and Manjushri to the left of the main figure? Okay, so here it is. Uh, if you have a lot of space in your altar and you have a lot of statues, of course, this is an issue to consider. But always we take the statue of Buddha Shakyamuni as being the main figure. So it should be centered, it placed at the center of your altar and also it should be raised. Okay, any other statue should be a little bit lower than Buddha Shakyamuni. Now we know that to the right of Buddha Shakyamuni, we have the lineage of, ex of all the lamas of extensive deeds, starting with uh, Venerable Matriya. And to the left of Guru Shakyamuni, we have the lineage of the profound view, starting with Manjushri and continue with Master Nagarjuna and so on and so forth. So if you have any deities or any photographs, any representations, of um, 
personalities that belong to these two lineages, make sure you position them to the right or to the left according to this tradition. Okay, now let's say you have a special yidam, a special deity. Let's say that Tara is your special deity. So if you have a statue of your, sta of your special deity, you will put it right in front of Buddha Shakyamuni, but just a little bit lower. Buddha Shakyamuni always has to be a little bit higher. Then again, according to the tradition that you belong, uh, you in front of Buddha Shakyamuni, you will put the main figures that have initiated your tradition. So, for example, in the Geluk tradition, we like to have Lama Tsongkhapa with the two main disciples. So they will be at the center of the altar in front of Buddha Shakyamuni. If you are in the Nima, mainly Nima practitioner, you would have there at the center Guru Rinpoche. Okay. Another thing, if you have statues of highest yoga tantra, you will put um, Guya Samaja and Yamataka to the right side and uh, Heruka Demchok to the left side. Then uh, following that, you will have statues of yoga tantra, then performance tantra, and then action tantra. So this is how we arrange the statues. Okay, uh, the last English question uh, was this. So let's say that in your altar you have a statue of Guru Rinpoche and it's a special day where you do Guru Rinpoche practice. Is it permissible or is it necessary even to take the statue out of your altar and place it in a special table closer to your seat? So can we do this or is it necessary to do this? And Geshe-la is saying that you don't have to do it, right? Go in the altar and take out the statue and put it in another table. However, if that works for you, sort of like now the statue is closer to you, it has become your central focus, you can clearly see it, you, you meet Guru Rinpoche, you have a special feeling. If it works like this for you, why not? Like you could do it, there's no rule against it. So although it doesn't, there is no degree that says on the special day you have to take the deity out of the altar, if that makes you feel better, uh, take it out. Again, if you take it out and you feel it, it's not really working for me, I don't feel very comfortable, leave the statue where it is. Definitely we can move the statues in the altar uh, you know, after a few days, there will be dust gathering on the statues. So it's totally permissible that you go in there, you move the statues, you remove all the objects, you clean them, and then you put them back again. You know, the general arrangement you maintain, but definitely you can move them for cleaning purposes and so forth. Okay, now we start with the two Chinese questions. The first one... Now, usually when we give the causes for refuge, we say that it is fear and faith. However, Geshe-la mentioned in the last class that we also need compassion. So why do we go from two, we increased it to three causes for refuge? And Geshe-la is saying, because here in this case, we're going for a specific Mahayana refuge. So because it is Mahayana refuge, we need to include these aspects of compassion. So it is fear, it is faith, and compassion. Okay, so uh, now the last question is about how we arrange the different gurus that we have in the field of accumulation. So it's okay if you just have one root lama, you just, we know where to put it, but what is if you have many lamas, how would you arrange them? And also, if you have received teachings from the lama's lama, how, what will be the order in which you would arrange them? Okay, so it is uh, like this. When we do this visualization, right, the way that we establish it is we establish a throne 
that is uh, very extensive. And on that throne, we establish five other thrones. In the central throne that is a little bit higher than the others, we have this composite being that we say it's my own guru, my own root guru. It has the aspect of Buddha Shakyamuni, at his heart is Vajradhara, and at his heart is the syllable Kum, right? And then we have rays of light radiating out of the heart of that main figure. The ones who go to the right, they will establish the seating or the arrangement of uh, the lamas who belong in the tradition of, of extensive deeds. The ones that go to the left establish the visualization of the lineage of profound view with Manjushri and so forth. At the back, there's a whole you know, lineage of rays that go at the back and there we have um, all the lineage of the blessed practices with Vajradhara. At the front of the main of the main figure, we have our own gurus. Okay, so when we have in front the, our own direct gurus from whom we have refer, received teachings, the main figure would have to be your root guru. Then around the root guru, you're going to place all the other gurus from whom you have received teachings. And the way that you arrange them, you have to make some choices right who has been the one that has been kindest to me who has benefited me most towards whom do i have the bigger bigger faith and so forth so this will determine how prominent the position of those lamas are okay now if you have a situation where you have a direct lama but you have also received teachings from the lama's lama again as you say we have to make this decision in terms of who is the most kind to me who has been kinder to me okay and this will determine which one of the lamas will take the prime position all right so in the, in the front of the main figure, where you put your own lama, someone will have to be center and front, right? And all the other lamas will have to be arranged around him. Okay, so let's uh, connect now with our text. We're looking at the main out outlines of the text. We have how to practice guru devotion, the root of the path, and after that, how to train one's mind after one has generated devotion. So for the first one, how to practice guru devotion, the root of the path, we have two outlines, how to do, to do this during the actual session and how to do it in between sessions. In the first one, how to generate guru devotion during the session, we identify three outlines, the preliminaries, the actual part and the conclusion. So in the preliminaries, we have mentioned that we have the six prepared Preparatory practices. Uh, we have explained um, about three of them. So the first one is that you clean properly the room in which you perform your meditation and your practice and you properly arrange representations of body, speech and mind. The second one is that you arrange beautifully offerings that you have obtained honestly. The third one is that you assume um, the Vairochana posture or any other comfortable posture. And then it says from within a particularly uh, virtuous mind, you go for refuge. So this exceptionally virtuous mind refers to the mind of bodhicitta. So what we need to do is that once we sit down with a proper posture, we need to generate the mind of bodhicitta and go for refuge. And then um, uh, we need to include in this outline also the four immeasurables. So in terms of going for refuge, the first of all, the first thing that we have to do is to establish the visualization of the objects of refuge. And we gave uh, kind of like a concise presentation of that last time. 
Now, in terms of um, how you think about yourself, you think that you are surrounded by all types of sentient beings. And sentient beings uh, are born in the six different types of migrations. But during this visualization, you imagine everyone as having a human aspect. Although they have the human aspect, they use, you understand that they uh, undergo the suffering of their specific type of migration. Okay, so uh, surrounded by all sentient beings, you are in the center and you are ready to go for refuge. Now to go for refuge, first of all, you begin by recalling all the qualities of body, speech and mind of the objects of refuge. And this induces great faith within you. Also, you remember that since beginningless time within samsara, you have experienced endless suffering. And now that you have this opportunity, if actually you don't put it into practice, if you don't practice Dharma, this situation will continue. You will continue to experience suffering. And just as you continue to experience suffering, so do all other sentient beings that surround you. At the same time, you recognize that these objects of refuge, they have the power to protect. They have the power to protect because they themselves are free from suffering and therefore they can protect others from suffering. They have great compassion. They have um, immaculate partiality. They don't favor one and disfavor somebody else. And they will always work for the benefit of others, whether others benefit them or harm them and so forth. So with these thoughts very strongly, understanding where your faith is coming from, understanding you know, the fear of suffering, their capacity to protect, you totally entrust yourself and you say, you are my objects of refuge, good or bad, whatever situation, you know it, I entrust myself to you. So this is how we go for refuge. Okay, so having said your proper motivation, we go for refuge. And the reason why we need to go for refuge is because refuge is what makes us Buddhist. If we don't go for refuge, we are not Buddhist. In terms of going for refuge, obviously we have a practice that can be much more elaborate and practice that is much more condensed. If you have to Time, it is good to do the elaborate practice and to do the elaborate practice you have to establish the visualization that we explained before so we have a, a guru who is Buddha Shakyamuni and represents the three types of beings the commitment being the wisdom being the concentration being to his right we have the lineage of extensive deeds to his left we have the lineage of profound views to the back we have the blessed lineage and to the front we have of all the direct and lineage um, gurus. Uh, and then after that, we have the various yidams of highest yoga tantra, yoga tantra, performance tantra, and action tantra. Uh, following that, we have the Buddhas, especially the Buddhas of uh, the, the thousand Buddhas of this fortunate eon, such as the 35 confessional Buddhas, the eight medicine Buddhas, and so forth. Following that, we have bodhisattvas. Following that, we have solitary realizers. Below them, we have hearers. Below them, we have uh, the dakas and the dakinis. And at the, at the bottom, below them, them, we have the dharma protectors. So once you visualize this elaborate visualization, you begin by reciting the formula. And you begin by saying, I go for refuge to the Guru, I go for refuge to the Guru, I go for refuge to the Guru. So we repeat this a number of times. We mentioned that, for example, if you repeat it a hundred times, you do a different visualization in the first 50 and then the last 50 of those um, the recitations. So when you say I go for refuge to the Guru, mainly you focus upon you, this group of your direct gurus and you visualize especially from the root guru 
that there are rays of light and nectar that have five colors. They enter, they exit from his body and they come and they enter your body and the body of all other sentient beings that are around you. They, when you do the recitation during the first 50 recitations, you imagine that these nectar are actually purifying your negativity in general, but in specifically, specific negativity that you have a accumulated in relation to the gurus so for example endangering the bodies of the guru uh, breaking or going against his advice his word uh, or disturbing his mind so you visualize that all of this negativity is purified with the nectar and your body becomes completely clean and glowing and transparent then as you move into the second set of 50 recitations, um, the nectar is actually filling you up. So you visualize that your life, your lifespan, your merit, your realizations, um, um, and all your qualities um, increase. And that in this way, you establish also a very special connection and that the guru will take care of you in all lifetimes. So this is the specific visualization that we have as we recite the formula, a golf refuge to the guru. Okay, so then we continue with the next one, which is a golf refuge to the Buddha. So again, we recite this a number of times. As before, we break up the recitation into 50 and 50. And this time we visualize that the purifying nectars descend from the bodies of the five groups of Buddhas, the Yidams of the four classes of Tantra and the Buddhas of the thousand, thousand Buddhas of the Seon, such as the 35 confessional Buddhas and the eight medicine Buddhas. So during the first set of 50 recitations, we purify negativity that we have created in relation to the Buddhas. And that, for example, could, it could include uh, making judgments and uh, um, preferring certain statues of the Buddha and saying, oh, this is better than the other. Uh, or selling statues as a commodity, or uh, giving uh, this, uh, borrowing to someone the statues in order to get money, to borrow money, uh, destroying uh, representations of the body, the speech, or the mind of the Buddha, and so forth. So in the first part of the recitation, mainly we purify these negativities, and the second part of the recitation, we receive blessings. Then we move into the next one, which is going for refuge to the Dharma. Again, here we do the same visualization. We say that the actual Dharma is the truth of cessation and the truth of the path that exists within the continuum of all these um, beings in the, of the objects of refuge. However, we have the text representing the, the truth of the path and the truth of cessation. So the nectars and the light will come out of those texts. This time they will clear away, as we say, general negativity, but also specific negativity in relation to the Dharma, such as abandoning the Dharma or trading in text, selling text for profit and so forth, showing disrespect to the texts, destroying texts and so forth. Then we move to the next one, which is going for refuge to the Sangha. And this time we will have the nectars coming out of the bodies of the five classes of the five groups um, of Sangha. Now, in terms of Sangha, we have the Sutric Sangha that is represented by Bodhisattvas, hearers and solitary realizers. But also we have the Tantric uh, Sangha that is represented by um, the um, um, Dakas, Dakinis, and also the various uh, Dharma protectors. 
that we have. So again, here we will uh, visualize at the beginning that the nectars are purifying general negativity, but in specific negativity that we have created in relation to the Sangha, such as, for example, criticizing the Sangha, causing division in the Sangha, uh, stealing possessions or misappropriating offerings um, of the Sangha, and so on and so forth. In uh, particular, you know, in terms of the Tantric Sangha, there is negativity that we do if we do not keep our commitment to make regular offerings um, to the protectors. So there, there are some ceremonies that we do like once a year or certain times of the month. And if we don't do them on time, we are showing disrespect because we are breaking our commitment. So all this is purified in this uh, visualization. Okay, so as we say, going for refuge can be done in an extensive manner or in a more condensed way. So this, what we explained up to now was the extensive version. So we can also do the condensed one. So in the condensed one, first of all, you start thinking about very well the causes for going for refuge. And then you recite just one line that says, I go for refuge to the guru and the three objects of refuge. I go for refuge to the guru and the three objects of refuge. So you repeat this many times. And uh, again, you have this uh, visualization of purifying nectars and light coming out of the objects of refuge. What we did previously in the extensive version, first we had from the guru, then we had from the buddhas, then we had from the dharma, then we had from the sangha. But here we visualize just from all objects of refuge simultaneously, from all of them, from their bodies. Um, we receive those nectars and those nectars will purify in general negativity we have accumulated since beginning last time but in particular negativity we have accumulated in terms of the guru in terms of the buddha in terms of the dharma in terms of the sangha so a more condensed version of the previous one Okay, so following that, we recite uh, the formula for going for refuge that says, I go for refuge and I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme uh, Community by virtue of practicing generosity and the other perfections may I become uh, a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. So with these four lines, we actually combine refuge and the generation of the mind of Bodhicitta. So the first part clearly you can see that we have refuge. It says, I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly, which is the Sangha. So here we consider ourselves and all other sentient beings that belong into the six types of migrations. And we consider the general and specific suffering that everyone experiences within samsara. And with that uh, very vivid uh, recollection of this suffering, we go for refuge to the, to the objects of refuge. And as we do that, we visualize again that there are nectars that come from the objects of refuge and they completely purify and bless myself and all other sentient beings. Then following that, the second part of the verse is about mind generation, and it's complete because it includes both um, aspiring and engaging bodhicitta. Okay, so as we say, the second part of the verse is all about generating bodhicitta, and it includes both aspiring and engaging bodhicitta. It says, by virtue or through the accumulation of practicing generosity and the other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all mother sentient beings. So here you are focusing on all sentient beings and you observe how they experience suffering. They experience suffering because they are under the influence of karma and afflictions. And you generate great compassion when you look at how tormented they are. So you then have the resolve and say, for their sake, in order to benefit them, in order to liberate them, I need to um, accumulate, I need to create and accumulate a root of virtue. Through, so therefore, through practicing generosity, through practicing ethics, through any practice I do, I will use this root of virtue in order to become a Buddha to benefit them. 
why shouldn't I become a Buddha to benefit them? I will become a Buddha to benefit them. May I become a Buddha to benefit them? So this is aspiring bodhicitta. And then you say that actually I will train in all those stages of the path without being disheartened, without um, fearing, without pulling away from any practice, I will train in this entire path in order to achieve this state. So this is actually referring now to engaging bodhicitta. Since you're having this thought, um, the objects of refuge are extremely pleased with you. And in particular, the main figure, which is Guru Buddha Shakyamuni, um, is so pleased that a replica of uh, uh, Buddha Shakyamuni separates from the main figure and comes and dissolves within you. As it dissolves in within you, you also become Buddha Shakyamuni. So it is very good to pause at this point and have the strong pride that you have become Buddha Shakyamuni. Just remain a little bit in equipoise or thinking about that thing. And... After that, rays of light emanate from your own body. These rays of light, they strike all the environment and all the sentient beings who live in these environments. The rays of light completely purify the environment from any faults and impurities so that every environment becomes a pure field. They also purify sentient beings from their negativities and their obscurations um, uh, from all their suffering and the causes of suffering. So they also now become Buddha Shakyamunis. They each sentient being becomes Buddha Shakyamuni. So this is the type of bodhicitta that brings the result into the path. Okay, so if we go back into our text, we were at the point where we did uh, this whole practice of going for refuge and uh, we generated bodhicitta and we did uh, this, um, we said we did this practice where we visualized all sentient beings having the aspect of Buddha Shakyamuni. So once uh, we go for refuge, it is very important to, con to continue with the practice of the four immeasurables. So when we do this, we say that right now I have got to the point where I visualized that, that I placed all sentient beings, I, took, I made all sentient beings become Buddha Shakyamuni. But this is just something that I imagine. This is something, just something that I visualized. In reality, I do not have the capacity to do that. I'm not capable of making ordinary beings become Buddha Shakyamuni. And the reason for that is due to all the partiality, having attachment towards that, those that are near and having aversion towards those who are afar. Therefore, it is very good that we all develop equanimity. So you start by thinking, wouldn't it be nice if all sentient beings have equanimity? May they have equanimity. I will make them have equanimity. And please bless me to be able to do so. So in this way, with it is very good to include the four aspects within each one of the four immeasurables. Okay, so we begin uh, with the practice of the four immeasurables and we say it's very good to have the four immeasurables within each one of the immeasurable. The first immeasurable that we work with is immeasurable equanimity. So there are four lines basically that we recite. So when we're dealing with equanimity, we say, first of all, wouldn't it be nice if all sentient beings have equanimity? So this is actually immeasurable aspiration. Then the second Second line we say, may they have equanimity. This is immeasurable prayer. The third line says, I will make them have equanimity. So this is immeasurable special intention. And the fourth line says, um, please bless me to be able to do so. So this is immeasurable petition. So this is how within one immeasurable, we have four immeasurables. So we have done the first one, which is immeasurable equanimity. The second one, 
is uh, immeasurable happiness. What we say, wouldn't it be nice if all sentient beings have happiness and the cause of happiness? May they have happiness and the cause of happiness. I will make them have happiness and the cause of happiness. Please bless me to be able to have, to bring about happiness and the cause of happiness. That's the second one. The third one is may all sentient beings be free from suffering and the cause of suffering. Oh, actually, it is like, wouldn't it be nice if all sentient beings were free from suffering and the cause of suffering? May they be free from suffering and the cause of suffering. I will make them be free from suffering and the cause of suffering. Please bless me to be able to do so. And the fourth one, wouldn't be nice if all sentient beings were never separated from the joy of higher, highest rebirth and liberation. May they never be separated from that joy. I will make them never to be separated from this joy. Bless me to be able to do so. So with each one of the four immeasurables, we have another four immeasurables, each one of those lines. In the second one, we're saying male sentient beings have happiness and the cause of happiness. So here the type of happiness we are wishing is a stable type of happiness. And as for the causes of happiness, the causes of happiness is going for refuge, establishing the 10 types of virtue, generating renunciation, engaging the three higher trainings, generating the mind, the mind of bodhicitta, and so forth. So they become the cause for obtaining higher rebirth, higher status. Okay, so we go from the first one, which is meditating on immeasurable equanimity, to the second one, which is immeasurable love, when we wish them to have happiness, to the third one, which is immeasurable compassion. With immeasurable compassion, we wish them to be free from suffering and its causes. So we say, wouldn't it be nice if all sentient beings were free from suffering and its causes? May they be free from suffering and its causes. I will cause them to be free from suffering and causes. Please bless me to be able to do so. So here, when we talk about suffering, we talk about the general suffering, um, specific suffering, the truth of suffering, uh, the suffering of the lower migrations, the truth of suffering in the gross form and in specific uh, for uh, more subtle forms. And when we talk about the causes of suffering, we have to talk about the 10 non-virtuous actions. We talk about um, uh, karma and afflictions in a gross level and subtle level. And we say, I wish to free all sentient beings from suffering and its causes. We come to the fourth one of the four immeasurables, which is immeasurable joy. And here we say, wouldn't it be nice of all sentient beings were never separated from the state of uncontaminated joy. May they never be separated from that state. I will cause them never to be separated. Please bless me to be able to do that. So again, when we go through this meditation of the four immeasurables, we visualize nectars descending. For the first part of those nectars, they have the purifying effect. So they remove all states that are incompatible with generating those four immeasurables. And later on, we receive, uh, we receive nectar that is like blessing that allow us to generate the realizations of the four immeasurables within our own mind stream. If we go back into our text, the easy path, it says, upon completing the practice of refuge, bodhicitta, and the four immeasurable thoughts, contemplate the following passage while reciting it seven or 21 times. For the sake of all mother beings, I have to attain in every way possible the precious, perfect, and complete enlightenment quickly and even more quickly. Therefore, I will undertake through the profound path of Guru Yoga the meditation of the stages of the path to enlightenment. So this particular con contemplation is called special bodhicitta. So we have already generated bodhicitta, but here it's like we have an enhanced version of bodhicitta. And this is why it is called the special mind generation. So we focus again on sentient beings and we say, look at the situation they're in. 
all of them, they wish for happiness. But it seems that they're completely oblivious to the causes of happiness, and therefore they never have the experience of happiness. On the other hand, they always want to avoid suffering. But again, they are confused, and they don't know how to avoid those causes of suffering. Actually, instead of avoiding the causes of suffering, they seem to be establishing causes of suffering. So their state is really deplorable. It's a really pitiful state. And looking at them, I can see that they have been experiencing this for eons and they will continue to experience it. Therefore, I have to take it upon myself to become fully enlightened Buddha in order to benefit and liberate and help all those mother sentient beings. So by all means possible, whatever it takes, no matter how difficult this training is, I will and do it. So this is the special bodhicitta. Now there are a few things to notice here. Uh, it says, I will obtain perfect and complete enlightenment quickly and even more quickly. So uh, you can see here that we have a repetition of the word quickly. The first one refers to doing it quickly through the practices of sutra. And the second one, uh, oh, you know, refers to doing it through tantra that is faster than the practice of sutra. But... The second one, even more quickly, is obtaining it within one lifetime, one short lifetime of this degenerative era. So quickly and even more quickly, I will obtain this state of Buddhahood to benefit sentient beings. Okay, so, um, so far what we have done is we have gone for refuge, we have generated bodhicitta, we have meditated on the four immeasurables, and after that we have generated even the special bodhicitta. What comes after that is that we need to establish the visualization of the merit field or the field of accumulation. So the way that we do that, up to now, we were dealing with the visualization of the objects of refuge. So we begin consolidating the objects of refuge. We start from the bottom where we have the, the Dharma protectors. They dissolve into the Dakas and Dakinis. They dissolve into the hearers. They dissolve into the solitary realizers. They dissolve into the thousand Buddhas of this eon. They dissolve into the Yidams of the action tantra. They dissolve into the Yidams of performance tantra. They dissolve into into the yidams of uh, yoga tantra, they dissolve into the yidams of highest yoga tantra. Now, remember that we had established a very large throne, almost like a platform, and in that we had the five groups. So now the five groups will begin consolidating towards the central figure that is Guru Shakyamuni. To the right of Guru Shakyamuni, we have the whole lineage of extensive deeds. There are many figures there. So all those figures will dissolve to, into uh, protector matria. To the left, the, we have the whole lineage of profound view. All the figures will gradually come and consolidate into Venerable Manjushri. Behind and at the top, we have the lineage of blessed practice. All of those figures will come and consolidate to, into Vajradhara. So now, Matriya to the right and Manjushri to the left will come and dissolve into the right and left shoulder of the main figure. And um, um, Vajradhara will also come and consolidate and dissolve into the main figure. In front, we had the direct and the indirect gurus. They also come and consolidate into the main body, into the heart of Guru Shakyamuni. So in this way, everything has been consolidated into Buddha Shakyamuni. Now we visualize that this Guru Buddha Shakyamuni comes and dissolves between the two eyebrows. And in this way, it's very good because you visualize, you receive the blessing of all this. Now, keep in mind, there are different traditions. 
according here we have des uh, described uh, how you go from establishing the objects of refuge and then consolidating and dissolving this uh, visualization in order to establish the merit field. However, you don't have to dissolve it. There are many who maintain the objects of refuge so it lifts up in the sky, remains up in the sky, and then below that, you establish um, the field of accumulation, right? So you don't have to consolidate it and absorb it. You can leave it there, and later on, there is an opportunity where we can have it merging down to the field of accumulation. So there are different lineages of practice. There are different ways to do this practice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question is what uh, this mention of um, having the qualities of the grounds and paths or the realizations of the grounds and paths. So what are those grounds and what are those paths? Okay, so in terms of the paths, we, in total we have 15 paths because we have five paths of hearers, five paths of solitary realizers, and five paths of the Mahayana. In terms of the grounds, okay, in the Hinayana we have eight grounds, in the Mahayana we have ten grounds. Those ten grounds, they are given different names, such as, for example, the first ground is called the joyous, the second one is called the stainless, the third one is called the luminous, the fourth one is radiating light, and so on, so on and so forth. There are ten of those. Okay, now those grounds actually begin from the Mahayana path of seeing. So when you have a Bodhisattva, the Bodhisattva will establish five paths. The first two, path of accumulation and path of preparation, there are no grounds there. The grounds, the first ground, um, actually occurs on the path of seeing and then on the path of meditation, we have the remaining nine grounds. So this is, in short, the grounds and paths. Hola! Okay, the question is, how do we make sure that bodhicitta can be generated for every lifetime? So everyone, after, after this, you have to remember to click your translation channel, otherwise you cannot hear the translators. Thank you. Hola! Okay, so um, this question about how do we generate bodhicitta again and again, not just in this life, but in the future lives. So a lot depends on the effort that we do in this life right now. So it is very important that we contemplate bodhicitta and we meditate on bodhicitta again and again. We mentioned how we progress along the paths and we mentioned the first one, which is the path of accumulation. The path of accumulation has three stages, the small, the medium, and the great path of accumulation. When you reach the great level of the path of accumulation, you reach a point where your bodhicitta does not decline from that point onwards. So it means that if you try really hard, you practice really hard in this life, and you reach the path of accumulation, and you reach actually the great stage of the path of accumulation, whatever level of bodhicitta you have at that point, it will not decline. It will continue unaffected until you reach the state of enlightenment. So plan A is to reach the great level of the path of accumulation in this life to guarantee you will never be separated from bodhicitta. But even if you are not capable of reaching that high level in this very life, it is very important to continuously try, to continuously meditate, to generate that experience of uncontrived bodhicitta as much as possible. So we know that the way to do this is to build up our accumulation and to continue with our personal purification. And at the same time, we should make fervent prayers that say, before quickly, may I generate, no, before long, sorry, may I generate the mind of bodhicitta. Uh, there are specific practices mentioned later on in the text, like, you know, what you do to increase your bodhicitta, what you do to make sure your bodhicitta does not decline in this life, in future lives, and so forth. But in general, that is the, the template. You try as hard as you can, you accumulate, you purify, and you pray that you get it. 
Oh yeah. Lola will invite you to translate to Geshe-la. So in some deities, some of the deities are seated on sun cushion and some are on moon cushion and some on sun and moon and some other moon and sun. So why are there many different types of these seating cushion arrangements and what are its meanings? Okay. So, okay, so when we look at the seating of the deities, um, usually, not always, we find, as you say, we find variations, but uh, we, you can uh, begin by looking at the lotus, and then uh, we have a sun, and then we have a moon disk. So first of all, let's begin with the lotus. The lotus represents renunciation, because we know that lotus grows out of the mud, but is unaffected from the mud. The actual flower is very clean and pristine. So the lotus, uh, which is a the basis of the seed i think uh, you will find every date is sitting on a lotus you will see it's there to indicate that they operate within cyclic existence however they are not affected by the faults of cyclic existence then if you look at the sun all right the sun actually is representing the aspect of wisdom so the sun represents here the wisdom, realization of emptiness, and so forth. So if you think about the rays of the sun, the rays of the sun are very hot and they incinerate, they burn something, isn't it? And that is because the realization of emptiness, the wisdom of emptiness, it incinerates, it burns, it's opposite, inconducive, non-conducive states, which is grasping at the self. So it burns away self-grasping. As for the moon, the moon actually represents the side of method. So it represents bodhicitta. And it's there because usually the rays of the moon have a cooling effect. It's not the burning effect of the sun, right? It's the cooling effect because bodhicitta has this cooling, pacifying effect. So if you see a deity sitting on a lotus and a, and a moon seat, it means that the deity really represents or stresses, emphasizes the aspect of method. If you see the deity sitting on a lotus and a sun cushion, it means that deity really emphasizes the aspect of wisdom. If you have a combination of all three, all three elements are represented. Okay, so uh, we will stop here for tonight. We just have like about three or four minutes left, but we have time to do our dedication prayers. So please dedicate that the teachings will spread and remain for a very long time, that the teachers who teach us the path will have long and stable lives, that all sentient beings in the six types of migrations will quickly reach a state of enlightenment and that there will be happiness and well-being all over the world. So please make the dedication prayers.
Amen.